same town, different, different apartment, but yeah. Yeah. just for as long as uh, things are a bit weird here. Right. right. <laughs> are we good at it yet? We're on, we're live. Okay. Okay, right. here we are. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sands Studios. It's great to be back here, um, as we've done several gigs here in the past uh, related to the Vortex, hence I'm wearing the T-shirt. But, um, and then it's lovely, and these guys, of course, are back. They did uh, just over, I think in December, they did a version of... Paul Motion's album, Lost in a Dream. Now, before we actually start, just to tell you and remind you that please you can donate to help the venue and help the musicians, of course. But secondly, don't switch off after the music's finished. We're very lucky that we're going to have Steve Cardenas, who played with Paul Motion and who helped get together the uh, or to publish the all the music of Paul Motion, and he will be joining joining us uh, from New York, and we will all be having a conversation together. So, without further ado, do please welcome Martin Speak, Rob Luft, Phelan Burgoyne, Yazgol. Thank you. 
Thank you.
very not very socially distant. Are we all yeah. Oh God. Are we all on? Mask up. Back here. Yeah. Are we all on? Yeah, I think. Can you hear us, Steve? Yes. Oh, great. great. I can hear you. Great. Hello. Welcome. Lovely. lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, lovely for you to join. Remember, I mean, it was lovely because, of course, last time we saw you here in London at the Vortex doing the other great master, Thelonious Monk, with Steve, yeah, that's with right. Martin. Well, Man, you all sound so great. It's and that was so... Uh, so it's it's lovely. So in a way, you've got that other common the, the other common bond with Martin, then isn't it? Which is absolutely. Paul Motion, yeah. and I will just will just sort of I'll moderate all you guys a little bit of the way as if uh, to the extent I can. But um, the first question is, of course, what was it like putting together the Paul Motion songbook? Putting together Paul Motion. Well, I wasn't the one that put it together. It right. was uh, C Cindy McGurl, and that's Paul's niece. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say within a year or a little more after Paul had passed, she's you know she basically inherited all of. Uh, Paul didn't have any children, so she took a, all, like all of his archives and and a lot of you know his drums, which I think Joe Lovano has some of that those instruments is, but, um, uh, and she started, you know, piecing things together. And I had had a conversation with her at, um, where I actually met her the first time at the village Vanguard when where there was a memorial for Paul, um, one afternoon. And, uh, I think m myself and several others were like, Oh yeah, it'd be great to have a book of Paul's music. And Cindy was like, yeah, I'm, I'm intending on doing that. So once she kind of got organized and and sorting out, um, you know, what she had, and she's not a musician, so she contacted me, and she also checked in with Bill and Joe. And uh, at that time, you know, Bill and Joe were were pretty busy. Bill seemed to be chiming in a little more often, but um, I was mostly, you know, consulting with her about, uh, so, so since she's not a musician, I would, she would send me several charts of the same tune and say, well, this one looks nicer, but, you know, what do you think? I said, well, that one looks nicer, but this one's more accurate. <laughs> this one's more accurate to the recording. So she, you know, she was, she's also, you know, an artist and in graphic design. So she could even take a chart that after she had scanned it, she could, clean it up a little bit without changing any anything you know and uh, and then, you know that took a while there was a, there was a lot of music and then it was her decision to break it into volumes one and two and um, it was so great you know I mean I had played quite a few of Paul's tunes being in the electric bebop it was really more the band that came after the electric bebop where we played more of paul's music which was which was an octet and unfortunately that group never recorded but we played used to play at the vanguard um but um there were a lot of the tunes that i had heard by the trio or the quintet you know that i'd never played and it was the same thing as when i was working on the monk project or a book with Don Sickler, you know, Cindy is sending me charts and then I'm listening to versions and I'm hearing things in a way that I wasn't hearing them before. And it was kind of mind boggling. Actually. Mm. <laughs> did, did he leave the charts in, uh, you know, in good order? Did, was everything cataloged or? I don't, I w I don't believe so. I mean, I'm, I'm only speculating. It, it might've been kind of half and half because Paul had a side, that where he was organized and he, he kept um, like notes on all of his gigs. He kept all of his set lists. Wow. So, so there was all of this incredible material that she has. Um, as far as how the music was organized, if it was all in one place or if there was some things that if she had to, I, I think she had to do a fair amount of organization, but, but um, it, I don't think it was too overwhelming. 
you'd have to talk to her about that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What proportion was unrecorded and what had been recorded, and how much was there of the unrecorded uh, well, stuff? Every, everything that you do, you have the song books, the two volumes. Yeah. One? yeah. Okay, so everything is in there. Hmm. I think she might have uncovered one other tune after we did it, <laughs> but um, but everything that's unrecorded is in there, hmm. and. Um, uh, how many are there? I forgot. I made a list. I have my little list here. But, but basically, their, their status is suddenly, the unrecorded and the recorded are basically equal status then in, in, in the songbook, effectively. Isn't in, it? In, in, everything's just alphabetical. Or yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a, but however, I think between the two volumes, I think there are about 20 maybe mm. unrecorded tunes or 25, something like that. Yeah. Why right. is, the, is an interesting what what thoughts you have that why they weren't recorded? What was it? Was it just you know, inappropriate? That, Did he just have them sitting around in a drawer? What was the? It's anybody's guess. He might have, you know. So what what would you say about any composer? That person might have felt like it wasn't something mm -hmm. they felt all that excited about. Mm -hmm. They might have felt it was unfinished. They might have forgotten about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know was, he I mean? com was he composing a lot before he started leading the bands and before he did his first albums in his own name? Was there, is there a lot of material from that time? I don't believe so. I, I, from what I've read, because I never had that conversation with him, but I've read a few articles and then heard, an, I think, in, like on a radio interview or something where he... Anyway, what I know is that I think think he started composing around the time of his first record and I think Keith Jarrett was encouraging him to do so mm. and he and Paul I'm, I'm not sure how the what the arrangement was but Paul ended up with Keith Jarrett's um, like first piano so it was a baby grand and he, and Paul had it in his apartment and he took some theory lessons from I don't I can't remember who I think it's listed somewhere and just started I mean with the I don't know how much theory factored in I think he was maybe also just trying to get a little facility on piano so he could compose but I really think he went a lot by ear but he had incredible ears um, the way he would put I mean first of all his melodies to me are just so strikingly direct and beautiful but when he would put chords to any of those tunes there's something about the way he put chords together <laughs> that, like no one i've ever you know like wow you went from this to this and it sounded amazing you know <laughs> mm. it's uh he really had his own thing and i and like i said i think keith jarrett um, really encouraged him then you know like one of the last records um, that the American Quartet did was mostly Paul's compositions. I think it's Baya Blue, right? Of mm. Keith. And I, and I would say just from that, even though he, Paul had done a couple of ECM records of his composite, you know, it seemed like from then on, you know, with that group disbanding, it was shortly after that he started the quintet, I think. And that would, to me, seem like that's when you, he got more prolific. I mean, I mean, interestingly, I was thinking the other musician that we know so well over here, a similar age doing his first album on ECM is Kenny Wheeler. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Also quite a late starter, as it were. And, and also, and, and, and I mean, I think, you know, I mean, they, they caught up a hell of a lot, didn't they? I suppose you could say yeah. that about Paul Motion. If he started yeah. at, in his 40s, how much he did exactly. subsequent. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, that's that's one of the things about just being artists that I think, you know, when people get caught up in kind of the, you know, the, I don't know how to describe it, maybe the, the assumptions or the media image of like, oh, we are so-and-so young lion, blah, blah. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of musicians are, can be and are really great when they're young, but when you're committed to an art form that's mostly based on creativity, 
it can happen at any time. You know, it, it can emerge or it can blossom at any time. And boy, Kenny Wheeler, wow, what a great example. As I said, very, very intriguing. A question actually, which is meant for both you now and, and, and Martin. What was it like to play with him? What, what was he like to be a, a leader or a partner in a band? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, amazing. <laughs> but um, yeah, besides that, uh, he, uh, he was very cool. I mean, it's hard to, to say. I'll, I'll, I'll speak on musical terms first. Which was, you know, I'd listened to him a lot with the Keith Jarrett quartets and Bill Evans, and uh, and he just zoomed in on the trio. <laughs> and uh, there's Martin. Hey, Martin. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so I'd listened to you know Paul play with Jarrett's group and the early Bill Evans trio and some different, you know, some of his own things. When I first started playing with him, the thing that struck me, well, first of all, was that I remember the first sound check I did with him, and Swallow was in the group at that time, too, so I was just meeting Swallow at that point. And, you know, Paul never did rehearsals. He just said, oh, we'll just run some tunes down at the first sound check on the first gig. <laughs> so I had to make sure I really shedded the, the tunes beforehand. And uh, when he and Swallow were... While I was checking out the amp, Paul was checking out the drums they had for him. And, 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 and Paul was just kind of hitting things, you know, just checking. And same with Swallow, he's just playing a few notes. But I remember setting my stuff up and, and just kind of stopping for a moment and going, wow, I know, I know who that is. They're not even playing music yet. <laughs> I know who they are, <laughs> you know, just by how they, you know, would play. We just kind of touch their instruments. You know, it was that was amazing, but when playing with him, um, the thing that really struck me time and again was um, just his center of time was so down the middle and consistent and just amazing. Whether it was out of time or like his his out of time playing, it still had this center and clarity, and he would fr and he phrases. He phrases through things, and he sets you up for the next phrase, whether it's the melody or the solo. I mean, he was just so compositional, almost like an, a percussionist in an orchestra, in many ways. And Martin, then, yeah, sorry, no, yeah, keep going, keep going, sorry. No, I'll just quickly say, you know, personally, he was so he was a lot of fun. He really loved his bands. Um, he really made you feel like you were part of a family. And uh, he, he liked to joke around and crack up. And, you know, he was an intense guy, but, and, uh, but he, was, uh, he, he was just amazing and very energetic to be around. He just had, he just had a, a lot of energy and intensity. And he had a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> What, what do you reckon, Martin, then? What could you...? I've probably got some sim similar experiences musically, as you're saying, Steve, but the roles were different, were they? You were in his band, he was in mm. my band. You right. know, so that probably the dynamic is different from that, in that perspective. And I always, and I say this to people, when people ask me that question, because um, I'd listen, like you, I'd listen to a lot of his music, and I knew what it was going to I knew what it was going to sound like. Because I knew it well with Keith and, mm -hmm. and Bill and then and, and his own things, of course, you know. And it was just, oh, exactly how I knew it would sound, but louder. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you know, really kicking me. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic. And exactly that thing you're saying about this time. I mean, I've, he had his unique time, but he's also from a certain era, era wasn't he, that's gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, to find people like that now with that yeah. that big beat or however people describe it yeah that That's you're touching them with what you're saying is this yeah. it's rare now isn't it to find that yeah. and exactly what you're saying in the in the out of time things <laughs> it was still the same mm -hmm. really well it's amazing that he kind of i mean not 
I don't know what amazing is the word, but it's interesting that he evolved the way he did. You know, he really had an ear for wanting to pursue music that was um, different. You know, I don't know any other way to say it. Like, as he said, when he came out of the Bill Evans trio, he really wanted to play with Paul Blay and play some of that music, that direction of things. But, you know, yeah, he did, he did come up through the bebop era um, in, in terms of listening and then beginning to play. But, you know, one of his first records was with George Russell, so he was already kind of playing with kind of cutting-edge uh, musical uh, artists. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you know anything about his personal listening habits? You know, what would he... What would he put on at home? Well, I, you know, he, a lot of different things. I remember one time he told me he was listening to opera. Wow. <laughs> and um, it, there was a time where a couple of years where I didn't, I lived downtown from where he lived. He lived around 107th and Central Park West. And at that time I was living around 51st and 9th Avenue. And there was a, I think, a dentist or somebody he was seeing in my neighborhood. And then, I initially he had called me and said, "Hey, man, I'm coming down there. You know, I want to get lunch." And okay. And then, once we did that, then it started to be like every couple of weeks he would come down because the neighborhood I was in was fantastic for restaurants. <laughs> and um, so then, he, you know, sometimes he would just call me and say, "Man, I was just." I remember one time distinctly where he said, "I was just listening to this Kenny." Clark take a solo and something goes and I started I almost started to cry. You know, he was so and he loved Monk. He he absolutely loved Monk. That was a de definite connection with us. Um, and I knew that about him anyway, you know, ahead of time. But um, there's a, you know he just loved music. He just loved good music. <laughs> seemed to well two things he did love you see i mean we could go on the him and pianists but we have two guitarists here <laughs> what was it like what was it to be part of it, that guitarist heritage playing with him and playing his music as a guitarist and and, and, and like that rob <laughs> you're you're coming at it now it be yeah, right. what, what was it like you know it's a great connect. <laughs> thanks steve so oh, man wow I'm a big uh, admirer of your playing as well. I've uh, listened uh, many times. I love those. Uh, what, which, which? Can you remind me which records of Paul's are you are you on? The first one I was on was Monk and Powell. Yeah. And um, that was when we were. I was on my first tour with him, and and I remember we were like on a train in Austria or something, and he said, you know, I was thinking, thinking I wouldn't mind doing another record of Monk, you know, but. But I already did that with the trio, and I just kind of blurted out, well, Monk and Powell were best friends. How about, yeah. you know, and he's like, yeah, I like that idea, you know. So we just <laughs> kind of took off from there, you know. Great. But um, there's that, and then the, the second one I'm on is called Europe, and yeah. that's when the band kind of uh, changed about three members. And there was a, a Italian tenor player, Pietro Tonolo. Oh, he's great. Yeah, he's really great. And Anders Christensen on electric bass. Cool. And Ben Monder and I were on guitarist. Chris Cheek was the other tenor. And then Holiday for Strings, same band. And then the last one that we did was Garden of Eden, which was more the New York version of that band. So Tony Malaby yeah. was the other tenor with Cheek. Um, and that was three guitars with me and Jakobro and Ben Monder. It would have been two guitars, but Ben had to leave for a tour after the first day of, we did two days recording the first day. And then I remember Paul called me up and, and he said, well, you know, Jakob's going to be in town. I just thought I'd have him do the second day. I said, great. That's how lucky, you know? And, yeah. and he goes, he goes, what do you think about having him come in the first day? why not you know <laughs> you know i mean you know <laughs> I, yeah, Paul would just say things to me like he already knew what he wanted to do he just kind of bounced it off you know <laughs> i really think that's that garden of eden is such a rich album the 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 sound world is just 
overflowing yeah. with like the texture is just so i don't know it's i've listened to it so much i think it's such a beautiful record oh, yeah thanks Perfect. it is cool and i'm really glad we had it he had talked about three you know three trying three guitars before and i'm glad we had a chance to do it and i think we did a band a week at the vanguard with the three of us brilliant um, but um but what was the question here? <laughs> just being uh, guitars. Uh, what oh, do you, guitars. Uh, Paul Nelson and guitars. I mean, there we are, three guitars he, he headed um, on to. What was it? Uh, Steve, can I ask you something? Steve, yeah, can I ask you something about that? Because Paul's, Paul's just got lead sheets, basically, isn't he? Uh, yeah. So how, did you figure things out that, that you were going to add, the th three of you, or you just all play the same thing? Or okay. Well, let me, let me answer the first question, which is Paul just loved guitar. And he talks about that in some articles. I think he, he either maybe when he was a little kid, he played guitar and he, like he was going yeah. to be a cowboy or something, you know. So he just always loved, he particularly loved like acoustic and nylon string guitar, which was part of his affinity with Sam Brown. Mm. Uh, you know, because Sam was really great at that as well. But, um, but the way, you know, the way we did it, was just the way we always did it, no matter what the configuration was, which was Paul just brought in tunes and he might say, oh yeah, we'll do this, let's just do this kind of out of time. And, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and he might say a few extra things, you know, okay, uh, yeah, uh, Cheek, I want you guys to play the melody and um, then maybe you guys solo together or it was very minimal it was very minimal yeah um, in terms of uh, instructions <laughs> it's kind of amazing because it sounds so almost um uh it's so i guess you guys must have really had an affinity playing together or something because there is such a i mean i've played with two guitars and it's a it's a challenge right um uh, a, a beautiful challenge but uh it can be you know um the thing i feel like that paul just kind of had a good sensibility is that he somehow got musicians in his band that were just good listeners and so that he wouldn't have to say very much yeah and he kind of trusted everybody to be who they were or just like nobody ever said oh you know you did this on one of your previous records with Bill. Should I do that? Nobody ever said anything like that. Yeah. Because because they know he would have said, "Don't do that, man. Do what you do." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard yeah. as well being playing mm -hmm. some of these tunes and not even the unrecorded stuff. You can still hear Bill Frizzell's guitar sound in your head. Just looking at some of these lead sheets, even me, I'm like yeah. looking at music that Paul never recorded and hearing just automatically build sound on some of it. It's quite kind yeah. of, they're so, there's such a... Uh, the, the ghosts are flying, you know. Yeah, the yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that tune, that last tune you guys did, Uptown Walk, wow, what an amazing tune that is. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I, I remember when I was helping Cindy with these books, I was, I would just kind of play through some of them on my own, but I, you know, you don't really get inside of them as much if you're not if you don't play them with somebody. But I, I, I had made sort of a note of it, but I didn't necessarily come back to it. But I heard you guys. Oh man, I gotta play that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did a I did a record of of Charlie and Paul's tunes um, about four years ago for this label, Nouvelle. They asked me to do this kind of project. So we recorded, uh, I made a point to do, I think we did five of Paul's tunes, and I made a point to do, I did three of the unrecorded ones, which were Prairie Avenue Cowboy, Riff Raff, and Tangram. And man, they're so, they're so fun to play. And, and you know, one thing, I know what you mean about, you can hear Bill's um, sound in your head, but one of the one of the things for me by playing because i the other tunes i picked i think only one of them bill had ever played on and so i kind of wanted to have music that i'd never heard him play cool. so i could kind of get into it more from my point of view if at all possible 
<laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's the uh, that's the aim. It's uh, yeah. It's hard because so, the music's so dreamy and uh, mm -hmm. it's so listenable. It's evergreen. Um, I always it's some of his albums. Uh, I can just stick them on and switch off, but then I feel like it subliminally goes. You know, the sound of those three, Joe and Bill, just goes in. You know, you yeah. put it on to go to sleep at night or something. It's such a. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, I mean, they had, a, they had. I think they're one of the great trios, you know, mm -hmm. one of the great jazz trios. And they, sometimes they just almost had like a music box like effect. There was just that, that like you say, that kind of floating, um, beautiful sonic, <laughs> just envelop, envelop you, you know. Yeah. So do do you think that we can, we'll get more and more awareness of him as, as a writer, as time goes. I mean, everyone, of course, his legacy is there as a, as a drummer, as a supporter of young musicians, but mm -hmm. what about the, the, these compositions now? Do you think that, 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 they're, that they're beginning to get recognized uh, for, what they, for what you've been talking about and these unrecorded ones that we've heard tonight, which are beautiful? Do you one think that that's going to happen? Hope. One can only hope. <laughs> you know, things... I mean, the, the, the best way for that to happen is for people to play the tunes. Because mm -hmm. I think that's what happened. I mean, even though Monk was pretty well known during the time that he was alive, it was, I think, a, a lot of his, I don't know what the right word is, just a, a lot of just sort of his magnitude as an artist came from people continually playing his music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that, are you hearing that happening, beginning to hear it in, in, in New York, uh, that people are beginning to switch on um, to his music? To Paul's music? Yeah. Um, I, I, sometimes. There's been, there's been a couple of concerts. There was, uh, there's been a couple of concerts where either his music was featured or was part of something that was similar to and and I, like I said, I did a recording that was the feature of Charlie and Paul's music, and then even on my record before that, I did a couple of Paul's tunes. So you know, I know for me, I'm going I'm going to kind of reach in, you know, and you know, add one or two of his tunes every so often to what I'm doing. I reckon the uh, the books can only help. I remember, Martin, you showed me the Monk book that Steve put together a few years ago. And now when you go around to, you know, half of the musicians' houses in London are, are now littered with that Monk book. So we can only hope that your your work well, on the motion book will be similarly successful. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, th th thanks. However, you know, I was just a cog in the machinery of those books. You know, I didn't put those together. It wasn't my idea even you know Don Sickler the editor was was the one that monk book would have never happened without him but we met at an, at an opportune time just by chance in a way where a friend had said oh you should talk to Don Sickler about because I had all these monk charts of things you know just like anybody else of things that you transcribed and collected and I I had talked to Don one day and and, he, and I just kind of showed him how I put some things together. And he goes, you know, Hal Leonard has always wanted me to do a, a book of all of Monk's music, but I never wanted to do it by myself. Um, would you want to do it with me if I got the green light from them? And so that's how that happened. And then, like I said, Cindy McGuirle, um she was so great with just organizing everything in a way. So all I had to do was just come at, everything from a musical point of view. I didn't have to think about how are we going to put this together and put it out. I think it's wonderful that she published those books in his hand, mm. which, which was key. Because um, there was a publisher that will remain unnamed that got a little snooty about, <laughs> like, well, we, we don't ever publish anything, you know, that um, it would it isn't in our, you know, way of, you know, manuscript, uh, as it would be unprofessional. And we were like, goodbye. Yeah. I mean, and, it's artwork. These, these charts, yeah. and they, his hand, it, it just, 
tells you how to phrase sometimes. I mean, well, that's exactly it. Is um, that by seeing the way he writes it out with no on any other instructions, you just I think that's you're going to get the most out of what the music is asking. You know, there's some things that, that it helps to know a little bit ahead of time, but these tunes, I, I, I would think Paul would want anybody else to just kind of approach them the way they want. I'll I mean, I definitely you, have my premonitions about, you know, playing this music, especially as a drummer. I mean, Paul was, is my hero and, uh, you know, as I said, the ghosts are flying. So, yeah. But actually, I think they're kind of they're kind of so sacred that I think they should just you can give them love by just playing them, you know, That's rather true. than not playing them and just keeping them on a shelf. I think it's you know. Well, you know what's true too um, is sort of this is true of monks' tunes as well. But um, Cindy has so Cindy has this radio show she does called Uncle Paul's Jazz Closet that you can tune in on the web mm. and she'll play she got a ton of cassettes of rehearsals that Paul did with the quintet and with the trio and everything she has a and she'll air these you know she'll just put them out on the air you know since she runs the publishing she just kind of feels like I can do what I want <laughs> which she can and it's great but um, she had a she'll send me little mp3s of, of those tapes once she digitizes them and she had a rehearsal of them running through Prairie Avenue Cowboy, which, uh, which was hilarious. Cause they played it more like a kind of upbeat country tune. Yeah, you know, I heard that. Heard and they're they're, they're yeah. laughing and saying yeah. we should get a gig in a rodeo club or something. Yeah, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the Lone Star. The Lone Star, right. Right. So um, but when, I, when we were rehearsing, Matt, so Matt Wilson played drums on the Charlie and Paul project. Thomas Morgan played bass and Lauren Stillman played alto. And when we got together and we were just kind of trying to decide what tunes we wanted to do, we were playing through a lot of different things. And when we played this one, it was really Matt's idea to, he said, hey, let, let's, I didn't really have any, I wasn't attached to doing anything in any particular way. And Matt said, hey, let's do this one kind of down and more like a country ballad, you know, or, or just kind of like a, but still with a groove, you know. Mm -hmm. And then once we started playing it that way, then it was like, oh, let's have Tom, just have Thomas and guitar play the mid melody, you know. And then we added two measures just for the phrasing, you know, because mm -hmm. we felt like the melody. So it was that sort of thing where we took a couple of small liberties to make it sort of our own. And I know Paul would have dug it, you know. He would, I know he would have been like, hey, that sounds good, man. Hey, yeah, I should play it that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well that's, I, think, I think we'll sort of slowly wrap up this formal bit now. And it's, well, you've got, I said, we've got the people over here who's, who are doing it, who are, who are, who are flying the, the Paul Motion flag. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, it sounds amazing. It sounds so great. It sounds so great to hear the music. Thank you, lovely. Thanks, man. So I'm, I'm so happy to have come down when I could see this was going, and they said they were going to have a chat with you as well. I thought I've got to, got to muscle in on this, and I'm so happy to have done. Thank you. It's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you all so oh, much. Thank, great. Thank you. I hope to make it over there when we're all through this. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> one night, we'll do it. We'll do one night, Thelonious, one night, this. <laughs> Two nights at the Vortex. Sounds fantastic. You're on. <laughs> All right. All right, you guys. Thanks okay, thank you. Stay Lovely. Well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Stay thanks, safe. Steve. And Steve. thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And donations. Donations for, for, for Sans Films. Olivier in Sans Films. Beans on toast. We need beans, beans on, on toast. We need beans on toast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. See you, Steve.